So far, we have looked at uh, language um, where while talking about various aspects of language and its, its generic features by now, uh, we, I was trying to make you see a particular point about language which is it's a, it's more like a continuum than like definite numbers for a particular reason that there aren't boundaries, specific boundaries defined at one place one stops and then the other begins. Okay? Now one can ask a question, is this completely unfair to count languages? But that is also not completely unfair because at one point on the same continuum two languages or uh, okay let me put it this way at two different points on the same continuum if we think language is a continuum things do sound very different right sometimes so different that they are mutually unintelligible therefore it's it's okay to count them as different numbers too as long as we understand that uh, in some some places on the same continuum it might be difficult or uh, or uh, languages share lot of things with one another as long as we understand these things we are we are fine then we we also started talking about two different aspects of language study that is the two different approaches through which language is studied one is language purely as a phenomena of human mind and the other is a language, the use of language in actual world real societies. These are two different uh, ways of looking at language. We started looking at some of them and we will go into more details along these two lines uh, where we will be focusing largely on language as a phenomena of human mind which is I language. Some of the, some of other things just to refresh ourselves and uh, to, to help you keep these things in the mind all the time as part of generic understanding or general knowledge about language. But it is, it is the most sophisticated product of human mind. Uh, what, what could be other products of human mind? If we say this is one of the most sophisticated products, it assumes that there are other things. Other things may not be, uh, may not be as categorically a product as, a, as languages are or languages. When we say most sophisticated product of human mind, we refer to other kinds of activities that human mind performs, right? And in such activities, it has a specific distinction. Okay? Uh, we will also go through lots of specific details uh, where we, we do not claim that we are studying human mind per se, but we will see how studying language helps us study human mind. Lot of scientists have studied human mind from different perspectives, uh, biologists, uh, neurologist, neuroscientist. In, in fact, uh, beginning from ancient time uh, and uh, philosophy to mathematics to life sciences, this, this part of a study, uh, this part of, uh, of, of scholarly endeavor to study human mind, that is the functioning of human mind has been one of the real goals of, of uh, many types of studies. 
nobody as of now uh, conclusively claim conclusively claims that they have they have figured out this thing however the the pursuit is on uh, do you know people studying actual physical properties of human mind have concluded that there is nothing inside it do you, do you know about this this position are you are you familiar with people who have studied physical properties of human mind that is when they when they have opened it up they found there is nothing inside it okay now i mean i mean uh, on a lighter note uh, that sounds uh, not just hilarious but uh, it it is consistent with what people have uh, and uh, from ancient time people have been calling uh, if they find somebody who doesn't understand much uh, they say his he, he has an empty brain right he has an empty mind uh, actually human human mind is empty there is nothing nothing in that now uh, that 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 part is just uh, a side comment however what is interesting about it is if there is nothing to see uh, then then how does it do all kinds of complicated computation is this question clear to you when when you open up any machine a uh, uh, motor engine or this kind of a machine you find lots of uh, lots of circuits lots of uh, uh, complicated machineries uh, uh, units in any one of them in in all of them however there is nothing in human mind at least there is nothing visible then how does it function is it, do any one of you know how it one of the ways one one of the things available in human mind helps it coordinate its functions no no okay have you heard about uh, neurons right uh, what what are they what is that what is that what is what are neurons brain cells brain cells not really not really cells but well if if we are not particular and technical in terms of definitions we can say that how many of them are there in human mind right and then uh, people are studying neurons claim that specific set of neurons are assigned a specific activities and then they report to one another and then to the larger units and then to the larger units and uh, they are they are also assignments in a way that uh, they can perform multiple actions at a time therefore uh, while we are doing other things we are either aware of things happening or we can perform multiple activities right now so that that's that's one part of it yet we do not know if there is a set of neurons assigned to language okay we know uh, or or at least we we believe that there is a set of neurons assigned for carrying information all over the place telling us information about look about environment around us and uh, pr- thinking seeing uh, 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 moving uh, mo- motor coordinated a- co- coordinations probably there are things for that there are specific set of neurons assigned for that but we do not have evidence if there is a set of neurons assigned for language okay that that's one, one point and and remember uh, uh, i don't remember whether i told you this thing in the last class or the before or the class before uh, there is still a discussion going on about language being coded in human genes so these are these are hypothetical questions that scientists are working on we do not have evidence for these things as of yet so this is what we mean when we say it's one of the most sophisticated product of human mind 
and we call it product because to otherwise to study human mind we need to look at its physical properties. However, if you look at the structure of human language then that leads us to the study of human mind as well. It sometimes when it is difficult to study the powerhouse probably looking at the product can help us understand where it is coming from. Okay. So, that way uh, studying structure of uh, language particularly human language and trying to find out its underlying system helps us understand human mind. That is if, if the underlying system of language is such that we are uh, uh, underlying system of language is designed in such a way in such a complex way then this must not be and and uh, this must not be a product of an ordinary activity and that way backward we look at uh, human mind and then we say studying language helps us understand performance of human mind as well okay when when we look at a specific aspects of language uh, and its complexities i'll remind you time to time uh, with reference to why it is called i language and what what it refers to when we say i language and then how uh, how uh, complex a phenomena it could be okay in terms of e language when we when we look at it it seems to be a very powerful social tool we have talked about the spread of language 6800 uh, uh, 1650 in India and then how uh, language and continuum uh, that we discussed and the, just I told you about it that it is difficult to count and how it is uh, how it can be looked at in both ways. How language becomes part of identity of human beings as a group as society or as an individual. Uh, sometimes it is it is more uh, uh, it is stronger than religion and other aspects of life and, and, and things like that. Therefore, it is undoubtedly a very powerful tool as well besides being a systematic, uh, besides uh, having an underlying system which is purely some, sometimes when you look at its structure you will see it is purely mathematical in nature. Uh, and uh, uh, okay, we'll 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 look at the mathematical part again when we are looking at specific structures and uh, at at all levels of sounds, words, and and sentences. More so at the level of sentences. And another interesting aspect of language is which also we have briefly discussed we are going to go into the details of that as well that when it comes to learning of a, of a language and here by learning I refer to learning of language as a child, learning of language uh, in a natural environment that is not in a classroom setting and we are talking about first language. All, the, all these terms first language, natural environment are technical in the sense of a study of language we will we will look at those terms as well. What I want to underline here is when we look at learning of language we end up concluding that it happens in such a way that we do not even realize what happened and before you realize you end up speaking a fully developed system which we call grammatical sentences in a normal setting. And which enables us to communicate with one another in a nice way and at that stage we say uh, now, now the child is linguistically adult and which happens, uh, do, you, do you have any idea when it happens? When do you think a child starts speaking a good grammatical sentence? 5, 4, five, four, four to 5 years? Yeah. That, that, that's simple. So by the time, by the age of four and five, uh, a child becomes linguistically adult 
in a very strict sense that by, by adult we, we, we do not mean a discussion on nuclear science. What we only mean is a good sentence. A child can convey you simpler things, that whether it wants water, food, it has uh, pain, it is not, it, it, uh, a child wants something, it, the child can talk in a, in a normal way and then uh, that kind of thing continues and we reach at reach different levels. So, this is what we mean that we learn it without putting any effort. Uh, and even as an adult, you want to go back and see, which people have done in a systematic way, what does really happen when a child really begins uh, speaking such a complicated system by the age of four? What could have happened? We can only say that it happens. We do not really know what happens. Okay? And I will show you some of them as well. Uh, and uh, you, you know these things, we have just been talking about it, that it is a rule governed system and it is the strongest marker of society, culture and identity. A, a few words about culture, I am not sure if we get to come back to this thing or when we are looking at sentences, I will uh, refer back to it couple of times. Uh, the only reason why I am bringing culture in it most of the time uh, in a class on principles of principles and parameters or about I language, uh, people would want to stay away from this, this term because they only want to look at language as a phenomena here. They only want to look at the mathematical properties of language that is its combinatorial uh, capabilities of how, how words combine as sentences and what are the underlying rules in it. I am bringing in here uh, this term culture uh, to prepare you for looking at in a little bit more serious, serious sense of the term culture and which, which, is, which is the following. When we acquire language or we continue enriching it, acquisition of language does not take place without acquisition of its cultural components. Okay? There, are, there are lot of things that are embedded in language which are attributed to its cultural components. Okay? And a speaker of a language, by a speaker I mean native speaker of a language, does not learn such things as a specific additional instructions they grow up with such things the way they grow up uh, speaking a language. Okay? For example, uh, if someone, if, if we have to say someone died, right? there are various different ways of saying the same thing in different languages. And uh, because I need to move to a different thing, I am not giving you a specific examples, but you understand what I, what I am saying. Now, nobody tells you which one is appropriate in which, which circumstances, right? but you know that. Right? Uh, uh, how can we talk about it without, without giving you an example? Uh, can can any one of you give an example? What are the terms for death? Uh, this is this may not be a great thing to talk about early in the morning, but nonetheless, when this has come up as an ex let let's talk about an example. Uh, give me give me just two three terms, and that could be in Hindi or any any other language. Anybody? Okay. Sorry. Serenity. Uh, which which refers to? Serenity or serenity. Okay. That's generally associated with death. Okay. No, that is not what I am referring to. I am re referring to different words for death in a particular language. For, for example, I can give you two from Hindi uh, Marana, Mrityu, uh, Dehant, and some of the derogatory ones. 
The moth is not a regulatory one. Uh, uh, okay, all right. Even these, even these four or five of them, right? Uh, when we want to talk about somebody uh, in a more uh, dignified and respectful way, which one would you prefer? Uh, if do we need to say, uh, uh, let's let's say let's talk about the recent one. I, I I don't want to use the example of Mahatma Gandhi. Let's talk about the recent one, or or or, or for that example, Mahatma Gandhi. Do we say Mahatma Gandhi ki mrityu ho gayi, or we say Mahatma Gandhi mar gaye? Which one sounds better? Why? More respectable, sir. The the other one has has little bit of uh, little bit of the other one is little bit marked, right? And and there are more derogatory ones than that, which we do not use. In a specific situation, so all all I am trying to tell you is we don't learn these things. We we are not given a list of words for different situ different situations, and then we are never told either in a classroom or 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 uh, in any other form in society that use this one for this situation. And everybody agrees on which one should be used in which situation. For example, when I gave you this example, I think all of you agree that one is marked over the other, right? This this acquisition does not take place uh, in a in a uh, in a in a uh, instructional way. Therefore, we can say that uh, cultural components of language also takes place at the time of its acquisition as a systematic phenomena, as a rule governed phenomena, all right? Fine. And this is why we say uh, language is a child's play. Really, it is a child's play because children perform much better than adults. And here I have a reference to, uh, it, it means more when you compare it with second language acquisition. So, every time we talk about a child, we mean first language acquisition and every time we are talking about adults, we are talking about second languages. So, it simply means that if you want to learn a language, learning of language takes place in a better way when a child learns it. However, as an adult when we try to learn a language, you know what happens. We can learn a little bit here and there, we can go all the way. Uh, very close to native like competence, we can say that ne near native competence, but we never depend on such competence. What we depend on or what makes us a native speaker of a language is the situation when we have learnt, we have acquired a language as a child while growing up. That, that is what it, it means. Uh, uh, and, and the last one, language is a special purpose cognitive ability is also related to the to the first one and it is related to uh, what we started with language as a sophisticated product of human mind. Uh, for example, when you look at other things uh, uh, like let us say swimming or riding a bicycle okay, or uh, 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 Okay, let, let us take just these two examples. There is a role of practice in these things. The more you practice, the a better swimmer you become, right? The more you practice, a better cyclist you become. And there are lots of other activities where, uh, which, is, which is cognitive ability, for example, singing. The more you practice, the, a better singer you become, okay? Such activities are called general purpose cognition. Language is called a special purpose cognition because there is absolutely no role of practice in language. Learning of language does not take place through practice. And I will come back to this and emphasize this more and I am only underlying this right now for you to think. 
lot of times we are made to believe that we learn language also through practice. The more we practice, the better we perform in language. Now, we can accept the role of practice in learning a language when it comes to second language to some extent. In acquisition of first language, the role of practice is zero. And I say it with responsibility, it is zero, absolutely no role of practice. A simple argument is, if we, if we, if we learn a language through practice, then we would learn only the words that we have heard. We will be speaking only the sentences from our languages that we have heard before. However, as a native speaker of a language, irrespective of which one you speak, you have capability to speak a sentence that you may, you may not have ever heard before. In other words, you have capability to speak or understand any word, any sentence of your language, whether you have heard them before or not. You, you get this thing? This argument alone completely rules out the possibility of practice in learning language. And therefore, language as a cognitive phenomena of human mind, as a cognitive ability is special in the sense that it is different from everything else human mind performs. There is a role of human mind in singing, there is a role of human mind in, in swimming, cycling, everything else. But the, the role of human, human mind in, in learning a language is very different from uh, learning anything else. There is one more distinction which is quite obvious, obvious uh, which is all other things that we have just mentioned like swimming, riding, uh, singing. You perform better at these things when you grow up. Your ability to perform at these things develop or increases when you are growing up. If you look at language, it decreases. The more you grow up, it decreases. Why that happens? There is a, there, there is an, uh, there is a theory for that, not, not assumptions and I will take you through that, that as well. Uh, uh, these are, the, again, I have just put them as a list here. These are the things which we have discussed. 6,800 languages, 62, 1,652 1, in India, which is approximately 25 percent from five different language families. Uh, uh, some of these things also we have discussed and I am just adding couple of them as new uh, fact here. Uh, languages of the world have limited sounds. They have sounds in a limited number. That is, no language goes beyond 50 or around 50. Okay? Uh, all of them will share sound with others. That is, there is not going to be a language which has completely distinct set of sounds from other languages. Okay? And again, this has reference to language continuum. The more, the, the closer they are on, on the continuum, higher the possibility of sharing larger number of sounds. Okay? The farther they are on the, on the line or the continuum, lower the possibility of sharing many sounds. Okay? So, it is no, no mystery that Tamil and Telugu will share more sounds than Tamil and Assamese or for that matter Tamil or French. Okay? This, this, is, this is no mystery. Uh, geographical proximity. Uh, geographical uh, coexistence uh, and, and mutual existence help you conclude that these languages will share more sounds. H however, uh, what, is, what is more interesting is no matter how far apart languages could be, it just does not happen that they do not share a sound or few sounds. 
all right and here once again to underline that it, it never happens that two languages will share just one sound for the sake of maintaining these rules. It is not just one sound, if, if not too many, it is definitely a bunch of sounds, all right. And that also tells us irrespective of geographical boundaries, uh, language, eh, language, language is definitely a, a phenomenon of human mind. Uh, and therefore, human mind functions alike. This, this sentence should not be uh, difficult for you to understand now, that language boundaries are porous. There are not hard and fast boundaries between languages and which is either consequence or uh, which helps people communicate. Uh, one, when I say co consequence, language being porous is probably a consequence of language sharing sounds, okay. Uh, or we can look at it in a different way, which is uh, um, they share sounds because they are cl in closer proximity and because, because they are porous. Now, when, when we are talking about set of sounds, all the sounds are not of just same type. Have you heard about these terms uh, consonants and vowels? Now, in the, I, I, I do not need the definition from you. I only want you to understand it because those definitions are not that relevant or for that matter we will we'll talk about that uh, and we will spend a couple of minutes on that. But I want you to understand more fundamental uh, stuff and mo uh, something which is more theoretical in nature. Now, in the set of sounds in a given language, again there is no language which has just vowels or only consonants. Whatever the number of sounds available in a language may be, that is going to be combination of both, consonants and vowels. Can you guess why or, or can you guess what would be the result of it? If I can give you a hint at the level of words, because eventually we make, we make words out of sounds. So, if, if we need both and all the languages definitely have both sounds, both types of sounds. So, what will be its consequence at the level of word? <clears throat> Any idea? Maybe you are thinking too hard, uh, therefore you are, you are not saying it. It is a very simple thing. No? Okay. Tell me what I am going to say is a consequence of that or not. If we have a word in any language, you cannot get a word only with consonants. Okay. If vowels are required in every language, then vowels are going to play a role in every word. In no language, you are going to have a word where there is no vowel. Pay attention to this carefully. You can have a, you, why, the reason why it was difficult for you to guess probably and I am guessing about it, it, you can have a word only with vowels. Okay. Therefore, we cannot say that all the words must have both consonants and vowels. Get it? We cannot say all the words of all the languages must have both. We can have a word in probably all the languages of the world only with vowel sounds. Okay. But there cannot be a word in any language of the world only with consonant sounds. Okay. While you are thinking about a word, on the basis of what I have just said, which sound is more fundamental? 
consonants are vowels naturally right vowels are going to be more fundamental because now on the basis of this we can say there cannot be a word without a vowel we can have a word only with vowels we cannot have a word only with consonants therefore we cannot have a word without a vowel does that sound does it sound like something mathematical to you do you, do you see some nature of mathematics in it this is the underlying system of a language at the level of sound and this this is way too fundamental that i am i am telling you which is see how how this is organized at the level of sounds that is or sorry or, or at the level of, level of words no words in any language without a vowel get it now at this note uh, can we quickly uh, talk about the uh, vowels and consonants very quickly because i need to go to uh, language and dialects very quickly what do you think is a vowel sound or what do you think is a consonant sound you may have heard these things and you when you hear these two types of sound you are told something along with them and and we we are going to look at uh, not exactly the definitions of these th these two types of sounds but what they really mean in a little bit more detailed way uh, Uh, not tomorrow tomorrow we will be talking about acquisition of language but a day later uh, that that will be next week but today i just want to hear something from you about consonants and vowel sounds what do you think is a consonant sound no we you have heard these two sounds for sure right that there are some of the sounds that are consonants some of the sounds that are vowel okay forget about the definition or anything about both what is what is the difference between the two no all right uh think about them i i think i am taking you to way to fundamental level in the study of language right about sounds and its classical distinction between a consonant sound and a vowel sound and yet i want you to think you, you not knowing this doesn't say anything about you trust me it it's really not saying that you don't understand anything or or you don't understand about sounds now what what i want your attention to is is the following a speaker of a language we don't need to go to a laboratory to establish we speak languages or we speak language right but it's very easy on the basis of this example to conclude when you speak a language you definitely speak you definitely have that inventory of sounds of that language again that inventory includes both types consonants and vowels right now you know the consonant sounds and vowel sounds of the inventory of your language right but when you are asked can you give me few vowel sounds in a classroom setting in an articulated way it's difficult for us to even tell the distinction between the two hang on here i'm not i'm not trying to make it, make fun of fun of it i'm trying to establish a point which is this capability that i know here refers to acquisition of language as what we know i language okay and that is the capability which refers to what is called knowledge of language and i come to this term again at that point in time it will be easier for you to see and i'll give you tons of examples of these things that language or the rules of language 
consist of rules that we all know, but we just do not know that we know them all. Like, like this particular example of distinction between a consonant and a vowel. Get, the, get this point? All right. So, we will we'll come to more of such rules later and please think about the distinction between, between two. Like, like I said, as a speaker of the language, we do not really need to know those rules. As a speaker of the language, we do not really need to know the distinction between consonants and vowels. But if we want to study them, there is a way to find out the distinction between the, between the two. And I, I am not asking you to look them up in any books. I am only asking you to think about them. What could be the distinction between the two? And we will make them more obvious when we are talking about sounds. All right? Okay. Uh, and I am, I am leaving the last part of CV, CV. CV, CV simply refers to consonant vowel, consonant vowel. And we will talk about these types of phonotactic rules little later. Now, uh, we, we have discussed some questions like these uh, before. So, keeping E language in mind, where does the language, is, where does one language stop and the other begins? We have looked at that and it's, it could be difficult. There are overlapping areas and those overlaps are not ordinary overlaps. Those overlaps are not inconsequential. They have huge consequences in defining the language or understanding language as a, either as a phenomena of human mind or as a phenomena of society. Uh, we will keep looking at them as well. Uh, we, we want to look at today where we did not get to spend, uh, spend a little bit time on language and dialect. Okay? And I want you to understand this particular distinction in a little bit more technical way. Uh, and by technical, I mean little bit more clearer fashion, which is the following. So, these are the things that you, that we hear when we, when we say a word dialect. Whether we put them in these words or not, these are the things that we have in mind. These are different words in the, under different, different bullets, but eventually there is a way to combine them all and this is what we mean when we say dialect. All right? However, even more fundamental than this is when we say or when we talk about distinction between language and dialect, what we know to begin with or what we assume is language is something superior and dialect is something low. Okay? The, nobody, de, nobody debates that. The, just the two terms tell about themselves that one is higher, the other is lower. Okay? This is there like, like uh, oxygen or blood in us. Okay? However, what I, what I want you to look at is that is not true. We can understand them which in whichever way we want. We can uh, talk about them uh, in, in different ways that we want, but that is not true. The moment we talk about up and low, we are talking about and, and I want your uh, undivided attention here, which is we are talking about language in society. We are not talking about language here. Okay? That is I language, at the level of I language, there is absolutely no distinction between these two terms. Okay? Let, me, let me first show you some of these things and then I will underline uh, I language again. Some of the things that you will find people telling you is languages have more number of speakers and dialects have lesser, fewer number of speakers. Now, if there is no distinction between the two terms at the level of I language and what we mean by I language is the way we acquire language, right? 
either two different varieties of language or two different languages. Okay? If we compare any language with Hindi, the total number of a speaker is going to be lower than lower, lower than Hindi for any language. Right? Does that make any other language dialect of Hindi? No. Right? Do the, also, do people learn two different languages in two different ways? When we, are, when we are talking about learning of a language as a child, a, a newly born baby or and when it is growing all the way to the age of 5, either in uh, the natural environment where Tamil is spoken or Telugu is spoken or for that matter French, English or German are spoken, they acquire languages in the same way. If there is no distinction at the level of acquisition of language, how can we say that that external factors will make a distinction in, in putting value judgment about the two. Okay? So, when we say there is no distinction between the two terms in a technical sense, we mean that, that acquisition takes place in the same way. That is, similarities or differences with other languages. If, if we call language A as language and language B as dialect, and let, let me give you give name, names here. If, let us say, if we say Hindi is a language and Braj Bhasha or Avadhi are dialects of Hindi. Okay? What, what, what I am saying is, if Hindi is acquired the way, in the same way as Braj Bhasha or Avadhi, then how are they different from one another? They are different from one another, of course, at the level of numbers of speakers. But then, in a scientific understanding of an object, the number of speakers would not make a difference. Get, get this point? Similarly, if there is literature available in a language and not in other languages, how does that make a difference between the two, two instruments as in, in the forms of spoken languages? It is just a matter of coincidence that in some languages we have written stuff, in the other languages we do not. Right? Uh, what is the language in which most of the books are written in our time? English, right? So that simply means English is. Uh, we we can uh, we can associate different kinds of values, value judgments with English. It's more important. It's spoken in a much wider uh, geography. It's spoken by large number of peoples. Can we say a language which? which is not spoken by same number of people or there are not those many books written in languages like let us say uh, Hindi or Bangla or Punjabi, that they are not languages. That is not going to, be, going to be true. So, look defining the distinction between the two namely language and dialect on the basis of these terms are only superficial way of looking at them. That is the only point I am trying to make. I am not saying that languages with lots of literary volumes are no good. That is not the point I am trying to say. It is just a matter of coincidence that a language has lot of books written in it and the other language does not have it. A language may have too many people speaking it and the other may not have, uh, may not have too many speakers. That would not make any difference at the technical level. At the same time, whether a language has a writing system or not, again is not important, because I have, we have talked about this, that we can write any language in any script. It is only a way to represent sounds. Now, when we talk about English, we are more used to seeing the language English in Roman script. When we talk about Hindi, we are more used to seeing the language in Nagari script. That is all, it is a matter of getting used to. Now, if, if that did not 
exist then then at one level we can write any language in any any script again this is not div i am not trying to devalue the significance of a script all i am trying to say is any script can write any language therefore again whether a language has a script or not has nothing to do with its underlying system okay and it will be clearer when we talk about its underlying underlying systems of languages therefore whether a language is lower or higher it's a socio it, it's decided on the basis of its socio political status and people start agree right power structure is such that we agree to anything only in that sense people accept okay fine uh, what you are saying is it must be true uh, one is higher language the other is not so higher language and this is so much in our in our system that we don't even need to say that and we accept these things however at the level of its underlying system acquisition and other technical aspect there is no distinction between what we know or what we have been told as language and dialect we'll keep looking at these things more and more when we look at these uh, these systems all right so we stop here i realize you may have uh, another <laughs>